Breaches are everywhere. What's a good security leader to do? Hello, everyone. I'm Richard Greenberg, founder of Security Advisors, LLC. Hopefully, I'll give you some really great information today that will help you moving forward with your security programs and your companies. A little bit about me real quick. I'm the founder of uh, Security Advisors, LLC. We specialize in network penetration testing, and we do assessments as well, help with remediation and handholding of companies to getting them to where they need to be for both uh, good security as well as certifications. Uh, I'm an ISA International Honor Roll and Distinguished Fellow. Uh, I've been a CISO for 15 years. I'm uh, honored to have been elected to the OWASP Global Board of Directors. I'm also the president of both the ISSA and OWASP Los Angeles chapters. And I, I founded and chair the Women in Security Forum. Hopefully when this COVID-19 issue ends, we'll be able to resume with that. It's a great system. So let's get started uh, with some details. There's a heightened awareness of security and we all know what COVID-19 has been doing. And uh, you know, boardrooms now have security on their agendas 80% of the time, which is definitely an improvement. Uh, they're a weekly news item, unfortunately, on mainstream media. Um, and we all know and have had our friends and cousins and everyone asking us for advice about security because now that it's mainstream, we are now mainstream in our positions, which wasn't always the case. Even the government, which is way behind usually with technology and advancements, is looking to create security and privacy regulations. Although I would not expect you to use that as anything for your security program other than to get visibility within your company and to possibly get funding. So don't look for the government to help you with your program other than to help you with funding because what they put in regulations is the bare minimum and I would not recommend that. So our data is leaking. Unfortunately, we know this all too much and breaches are occurring everywhere. Every company, phishing attacks are multiplying and are now the preferred method of infiltration. Um, and it's 279 days before the average company can even become aware of a breach and contain it. And uh, quite often they find out from the FBI or some other external source because their monitoring systems aren't in place with enough capacity to understand and identify this. Uh, what's the life cycle of a malicious attack from breach to containment? 314 days and attackers are now silent. The old days of, of doing uh, issues to the website, you'll, you might get a little bit of, of that if uh, there's anonymous is, is involved, but most often the hackers just wanna get the data and not even let you know that they were there. So the, the landscape has changed quite a bit and the times are changing. And the question is, are you? Because every business is now a target or the medical devices and, and IoT devices on your network, your car, your refrigerator. Yes, we know that about that. Smart TVs and boardrooms have become targets. Uh, what about your business transformation strategy? Do you have one of these to carry on and, and deal with this? Um, important questions. So what the heck is going on? Because old vulnerabilities are still everywhere. You remember SQL injection. That's 13 years ago, and guess what? It's still happening regularly. It's still in the top, OWASP top 10. That should not be happening, right? DDoS attacks that rely on the vulnerability in the universal plug and play protocol were known since 2001. Those are still happening. I can go on and on with that. That's just a couple of examples. Patching is problematic. I've had interviews with fellow CISOs where they say, well, we just can't patch everything. There's just too much. It's too, we, or we're an enterprise, we're huge. I'm like, well, you know, you have to figure out a way to make that happen. Change management, it's very haphazard in companies, right? That's got to change. Configuration management, what protocols do you have on and running? Do you need them all? Are you securing your systems? How about your printers and copiers? Nice back doors to let the hackers in. And what about encryption, right? Are you encrypting your mission critical information? So let's talk about data breach costs. So, you know, the extensive use of IoT devices, that's, that's increased by about $5 per record, the cost for a breach. And these statistics are all from the Ponyman Institute research study from last year. 
a mega breach of a million records, which is not a lot in a lot of systems today, that will cost an average of $40 million. A mega breach of 50 million records, and we've seen a lot of those the last couple of years, will cost an average of $350 million. And then again, there's third party breaches, which are really the things that you've got to be extra concerned about since you don't have direct control over those, but they'll cost an extra 370K. So these are things to be important. And how about the global average of just a data breach in general? It's 3.9 million. Uh, so these are big numbers. And we see that the breaches are increasing as is the sophistication. In the old days, they would just go in there and do some basic stuff and everybody would fall for it. Security programs are getting better, but the, the attackers are getting smarter too. They're still automating, right? But essentially, all organizations are targets for criminal hackers. Uh, so what can we do? What is a good security leader to do? Well, go on tour, take your show on the road, speak at division meetings, speak at general staff meetings, make security a standing agenda item at every big meeting with executives at your company. Of course, security awareness is key. Address your company's vulnerability trends, gamify your training, don't do what I'm doing. Don't just do a PowerPoint. Make it entertaining for the people where you work. Have contests. How about the primo parking spot for the people that have come up with the best security ideas, right? How about a cash or, 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 or Amazon gift card or something along those lines? How about pitting different divisions against each other in a contest to see which one can identify the most vulnerabilities in the game or something, right? These are things to consider right, that you need to think about because just another PowerPoint, you're going to have people dazing off, closing their eyes, just clicking through. And phishing simulations are becoming more the norm, but please don't exclude your executives. I know they tell you that they need to be excluded, but they are one of the most vulnerable pieces in any company's hacker strategy. So please be careful with that. And how about your own team? Make sure they're trained. Don't exclude system admins and security professionals and developers, key people. Now we've got to have effective security patch management. I mentioned it earlier, but you know, you've know you got to have processes in place to ensure regular, time, timely and enterprise-wide patching. First, you do your patching on a, on a pilot group. Make sure that there's no issues. Not every patch is coming clean from our vendors. Don't forget your third-party apps. Minimize excluding systems. I'm sure that you've had interactions with system admins who say, no, I can't patch this system. It's just, it's too mission critical, or there's, there's something about it that's so proprietary that they're worried about bringing it down. Minimize those, do tests. You will have to exclude some. However, you can isolate those systems. You can put them in a, in a separate VLAN, have certain firewall rules to address that. Uh, so don't just accept it and exclude them and think you're going to be fine because there's your back door. All right. Meet with the key players in your companies and organizations. Try to get some lunches with the key executives, right? If you're a CISO or the head of security, quite often you're buried somewhere down the hierarchical chain. Maybe you're reporting to a CIO or a CTO, right? So how are you getting those regular meetings with the executives? It's worth it to spring for lunch with these executives. There's nothing like personal interaction. And in addition, people have these subliminal things going on in their brain. You take an executive to lunch, they will remember that. And when the decision comes, hey, should we hear from this person or not? They might be more inclined than not to go, I mean, let's see what they have to say because you were nice to them, you chatted with them. So keep that as, as a key strategy. Right? A lot of these things that you'll be seeing in my presentation are people skills, right? We all know about a lot of the technical skills and, and technical solutions. That's gonna be in here today, but the, but the people skills are really what differentiate the successful security professional from the ones that have good intentions, all right? You've gotta meet regularly with other people who you might not consider as, as the people you would normally think of, right? We all think about CTOs and division leads, but make sure legal and risk compliance are on your blackboard because the chief function for the head of security is risk, 
It's not technical, it's risk, right? And please learn to talk business ease. I wouldn't look it up in Merriam-Webster's, but that's my term for what we have to do. We've got to talk the language of the decision makers. So establish and test the change management process. Form the change management board. Make sure it meets regularly. Really important stuff. Now, policies. Um, be careful, all right? Do not include your procedures in your policies. And the reason for that, the policy should be in one pager. It tells what you're going to do. It's the procedures that tell you how you're going to do that. And one of the key points here is to get a policy change in a company typically can be a big deal. Uh, it can involve human resources. It can involve the unions if you're in a union uh, company. And those can take a while to make a change where procedures change regularly. So make sure about that. Uh, review the policies regularly and any time a significant infrastructure change occurs. Um, always engage human resources. You have to have your entire staff sign an acceptable use policy every year. And this is for legal reasons. So they, you can claim that they were aware of what your policies were in case there is anyone who goes against the policy. Um, have a plan and procedures for securing portable devices and BYOD. Don't punt on BYOD. It's too important, has too many implications. Every user wants to just use their own device, uh, but there's, there's legal uh, e-discovery issues if they do. So make sure they're aware of it um, and make sure you've researched uh, good MDM solutions moving forward. Uh, bake security into the SDLC. We want it to actually be SSDLC. We want it secure right? Um, let's talk about relationships. Application development and InfoSec, they need to be joined together. The heads of both of these organizations have to, if they're not friends, at least have a good relationship. Uh, they've got to connect. Uh, InfoSec's got to be there from the beginning of every project. They've got to be on the assessment team that looks at, at projects, uh, not just executives, not just the admins, uh, but InfoSec's got to be there. Um, a little more technical stuff, when you're building your, uh, your SDLC, make sure you're scanning for uh, web or potential vulnerabilities and static can be done incorporated into the, the coding process and the dynamic is done typically by the information security team on the compiled code uh, right before it goes live. Uh, there's also uh, lots of open source solutions that you can look to uh, because some of these solutions can get quite pricey. Um, but there's also runtime application self-protection as an option as well. Look into that. Uh, the ultimate goal is to automate as much as we can, uh, particularly with DevOps. They're going to be running that train down the express track. And if you're on the local, they'll pass you by. So um, try to do as much automation as you can, but nothing can replace a good manual pen test. And I would recommend that highly for every critical app where you work. Don't think that just automation is the answer. Um, we wanna get our application security teams tested and trained, and there's lots of training that they can have, some of it even through OWASP, uh, but the, you talk to your fellow CISOs and see what, what training the, their app dev team has been happy with. Um, make sure that every project is reviewed by InfoSec throughout the entire life cycle. Uh, there's plenty of free tools and templates and frameworks from OWASP. Uh, ASVS is a great framework. I highly recommend everybody look to OWASP. Uh, it's a de facto standard for a lot of things moving forward with application development. Don't forget your security environment in the physical aspect. This quite often is overlooked by people who cut their teeth in the technical world, right? Um, physical solutions without InfoSec involvement, recipe for a disaster. You know those physical access cards that people use for security to get around your buildings? The majority of them are easy to hack. Yes, and that part of the reason is because the physical security folks have not had ample training on the technical security. And again, I'm generalizing, but we've seen this. I've read studies of people who have successfully hacked many companies' ID cards. Um, are you taking extra care to know exactly who has access to your data center, whether they need it, whether they need 24 seven or just certain security windows? That's important too. And 
can people just walk out of your building, carry anything they want? You should have some kind of plan to assess that no one's walking out with an external hard drive or a PC. It can be, it can be a, a big problem. Monitoring. We talked about the large number of days that go by before someone can even identify a risk or a breach, but you've got to monitor your systems regularly. Are you able to detect anomalies in your network? They're going to happen, and that can be the, the lifesaver to avoid a breach. You know, do you know if you've been compromised? Most companies don't. Can, are you able to detect strange outbound behavior? You know, let's say you're sending traffic to China or North Korea. If you don't do business there, that might be a red flag. All right. Um, what about, for example, if 50 users all had their accounts locked after unsuccessful login attempts? If you just answer your help desk calls one at a time and take care of it, but you don't look for patterns or you don't look for a level two or three review of all the incidents that happened on your network for correlation, you potentially could miss the next hack coming in. And, you know, are you using an MSSP? Uh, more and more companies are, but they are not all created equal. So please talk to your peers. I've heard stories where people have said, hey, they saved us from a major breach. Other people have said, we found out about this stuff before them. Why am I paying all this money? So talk to your fellow CISOs. Now, reporting is very important. All right, You're, we're all running our network vulnerability scans, right? Um, make sure you do your remediation plans, remediate, and then rescan. Don't wait for the next cycle necessarily. You want to make sure you're addressing and locking down your systems. How about looking at all the various tools that we have and, co and collaborating and correlating this information. For example, run your vulnerability scan, then look at your patch management solution and look at your endpoint security solution. Put all those reports together and generate an exception list for PCs that are showing up on your vulnerability scan, let's say, but are not showing up in your endpoint protection scan. Hey, Patches that you deploy don't always get installed correctly and agents don't always get installed correctly. When I was doing this, we found every time we ran it, we found uh, an install that just didn't complete correctly, which meant that the system was vulnerable. But without these types of correlations, you would never know it, okay? Always follow up on your remediation efforts and uh, rescan, as I mentioned. Access management standards are very important, okay? Provisioning and deprovisioning. If someone leaves your company, are you sure that they lost every access they have to every system? Are you sure? Do you even know who has access to what? I've seen scope creep where people have changed jobs and still retained access to old systems that they should not have access to any longer. Periodically audit your systems to find out. Also, MFA, every admin access needs to have multi-factor authentication. This is a recipe for disaster if you don't do that, right? You should also consider MFA for every system, definitely for every critical system, but possibly even for all your systems, right? You assess your risks and make that determination. Some of this depends on culture, where you work, but admins and mission critical systems, there should be no discussion, right? And please talk to your system admins, make sure as they log in for normal work during the normal day, that they are not logged in with admin privileges. They should have multiple accounts, a regular account and an admin account. And the admin account is where they log in if they need to do some admin work, make changes to systems. But a lot of the everyday work does not require that. So please, you know that that's a people issue, but you need the support from the head of IT to make success on that one. Hey, did I mention patch before? Sure did. You know, if I have to choose the most important thing I'm telling you today, it's patching. Having a good mature patching program will mitigate at least 75% of the risk where you work. It should be the number one on your list of security control controls. Um, you know, if Equifax had listened to that, they would not have been breached. The WannaCry ransomware attack would not have happened if this was the case. So don't underestimate the importance of a good patching program. You need to have good incident response, and that includes a great plan. But this plan 
can't just sit there. It's got to be tested regularly. And who's on your incident response team? It better have the people from the right locations, business representatives, attorneys, public relations, finance. It's the public relations team that's going to be addressing your shareholders and the public if you are breached and you have to report it. They can't, they can't just show up. They've got to plan this. Uh, finance has to be aware of it. And your attorneys, of course. So don't forget these people. Um, in the 2019 Ponyman report, having an incident response team reduces the cost of a breach on the average by $360,000. And then there's encryption. Please consider, if you can, encrypting everything everywhere where you work. I think everyone's encrypting everything in transit, but, but data at rest is vulnerable as well. If someone breaks into your system, they can grab it unless it's encrypted. And don't start getting fancy and thinking you're going to build your own encryption algorithms. AES is the trusted U.S. government standard. Use that or something even more secure, but don't make your own up. It's not a good strategy. Um, key management is very important. That could be a big gap in your entire security posture. If you don't rotate your keys, have a good plan and how those are accessed, who has access to them. Um, don't store them on the same server as your data, right? Um, don't use insecure protocols such as Telnet or SSL. Some people might still be using SSL. And TLS 1.2 is the bare minimum you should be using. Um, another statistic from the 2019 Ponyman report is extensive use of encryption reduces the average cost of data breach by 360,000 as well. Let's talk about disaster recovery, okay? Too often, business throws it to security and says, here, you own this. Well, it's the business, the key business stakeholders that have to own it with security taking the lead, perhaps, right? Um, they've got to be involved. You cannot just build this on your own because they have to identify the acceptable downtime, which is the recovery time objective, and they have to identify the acceptable loss of data, which is the recovery point objective. This is the business risk they are accepting, okay? You've got to identify all the mission critical systems, prioritize them, figure out which ones you're going to bring up first and how, and how soon. Of course, you've got to align this with the business continuity plan. And you've got to test this plan on a regular basis. Don't just build it and walk away and hope it works the day you need it. Because we know Murphy lurks. And some companies are actually backing up to the cloud. Uh, maybe not all their data, but some you might consider doing that. You've got to network and collaborate as well, right? The fact that you're here, well, not here because this is a virtual event, but the fact that you're watching this and you're participating tells me that you are networking and you believe in the power of networking and collaborating. I have learned so much from my fellow CISOs over the decade and a half that I've been doing this. It has shortened my development time for my security plans tremendously. I've gotten contacts, I've gotten templates, solutions, spreadsheets that help me be successful from my fellow participants, right? Uh, there's FBI, InfraGuard, um, definitely, if you're not a member of a local OWASP chapter, you've got to do that. There are other organizations out there as well. Um, maybe you want to form a new group, a new meetup. But there are a lot of local meetups where you are. Once this COVID-19 mess you know, clears up, look for local meetups for areas of importance to you, and you'll be amazed at how many you'll find. There's thousands now. Keep learning, of course. Right? You can subscribe to alerts. You can subscribe to US CERT. Um, there are plenty of webcasts that you can see. Uh, lots of them are vendor webcasts, let's be honest. At OWASP, we are strangely adherents of pure vendor neutrality. So you will see great content here without me or anyone selling anything, but a lot of them do. So just be aware of the difference. There's a lots of good blogs that you can read. Check out podcasts training, ongoing training. Life is about learning and training. So please continue to do that. Uh, yes, books. I don't know how many people own books anymore, but there's a lot of good stuff that you can learn. LinkedIn and Twitter le uh, links are very important. I start my day 
by opening up Twitter and LinkedIn. And I can't tell you how many times the links that are in there are just filled with great information, both about the latest news, but also I things I could take back to work and act on immediately. This one is, is near and dear to me. We have a huge gap in the number of qualified people in security. We have a huge gap in diversity as well. If we can address diversity by making a more open and rewarding environment for people of diversity, this helps fill the, some of the gap that we have and will be getting in this field. Um, we have to have a, a warm and welcoming. It's about attitude, it's about perception. Uh, I'll give you an example. I've seen some things written for an opening where they talk about war and let's kill the competition and let's do, and these are military terms and they don't always go over well with, with certain people. Uh, some women would prefer a more, and, and some men as well would perform a more teamwork oriented approach rather than kill, kill, kill. So just be careful of your language. Students deserve a chance. They're the next generation. Let's help them, mentor them, speak at schools. There are cyber competitions we can do. And consider uh, you know, helping with curriculums. A lot of the problem, particularly in application security, is that these coders learn how to code in school that does not have enough security baked into the curriculum. We can help with that. Most importantly, and I saved this for one of my last slides, the executive team is the key to your success. You cannot do this on your own, all right? Are you advising them with the key risks that they need to make decisions, right? Have you matched your cybersecurity strategy to the organization's business risks? Do you know the business risks? Do you speak business ease, as I said, right? Don't get involved in a dialogue with the business about anything other than risk and money. Don't show them reports with how many attacks you've had, how many infiltrations, just talk risk and money, all right? And then of course there's cyber insurance, right? But here's a word of caution about that. Oftentimes you might need a secondary policy because the first one won't insure you for enough of your risk or enough of your data, right? Also, there is a form that every insurer makes you sign off on that's saying, are you doing this, 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 and this? If somebody just signs off on that, but you're really not doing it, what will you get if you're breached? The big O. So please take this seriously, all right? Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Here's my contact info. I invite you to connect with me on uh, either with my company or um, Twitter or LinkedIn. And with that, stay safe out there. Thank you very much.